What's up, everybody? Welcome back to my channel. So we are here for another episode of Rachel Goes Rogue from Rachel Levis, who used to be on Vanderpump Rules. Now, she usually names her podcast titles Chapter... We would be on 11. But this week, she didn't name it Chapter 11. Why is it just Vanderpump Rules, You're So Vain? Very interesting. I will also say the show notes say, Rachel takes the headlines head on. Vanderpump Rules and its cast can't seem to keep themselves out of the press. Rachel gives her rogue take. I'm interested to see what she has to say. I also do want to talk to you guys really quick about something. So right now, you will not be able to see any of the chapters here on my YouTube channel. If you are seeing this video now on my YouTube channel, that means everything has worked itself out. If you are watching this on my Rumble or Odyssey, I will just say Rachel's production team has struck my channel three different times. So right now, I'm in the process of disputing 10 videos that they are trying to claim as their own. Now, there is a problem with this. They cannot claim their videos as theirs because the only thing that is in there that is theirs is the audio, which has been transformed for commentary purposes and follows the fair use guidelines. I've also transformed it in other ways. I've also taken sections out, things like that. So by these guidelines, I have not broken any rules of copyright and I have followed fair use. So I am disputing this. I have talked to YouTube about this, but it's kind of like an up in the air thing. I can't do anything until they do something. And right now we are waiting for them to let me know within 10 days if they are going to serve me to the copyright board to go forward with this or not. So right now I believe we are on Day number seven for most of the claims, because it was done on the 22nd at like two o'clock in the morning, but we won't even go there. Um, and I have 10 days where they have to provide something to YouTube, whether they are serving me or they're disputing something and they fix their amendment, all of that stuff. It's a whole waiting game. So pretty much I'm waiting it out. I'm here on Rumble. I'm here on Odyssey. I've always been here on Rumble and Odyssey. So if anything ever happens, I'm here. I also have a backup channel, which I will link in all of my descriptions. It's all things sunshinery. I will be posting that over there as well, along with hopefully my main channel when this all gets sorted out. So if you are watching this on Sunshinery, that means things got sorted out. And let's just say I will not let her production team take away and make a bias about how I feel about her. I still will give her some credit where credit is due. I still feel the way I feel about the affair. And none of this will detract from my commentary in the podcast and my opinions regarding the situations. I just think what she did is kind of fucked up. I think her production team, because of that other channel that was posing to be as her, and we had all questioned it. We had all wondered what happened when all of a sudden it went completely gone and it changed its name and all of that. And that was because they were just taking her audio and putting it on their channel, not transforming it, no commentary, nothing. That is why that channel could have gotten the strikes that they deserved because they were actually not doing it according to fair use guidelines. And they were literally stealing her work. Where I'm not stealing her work, I am giving my commentary and opinions on it. That's why some of you always ask me, why can't I leave it to the end of the video? Well, this is why. I need to transform it. I need to give my commentary in between for the transformative properties to be able to use it as fair use to be able to bring my opinions to you guys. So unfortunately, I just wanted to explain all this to you guys in video format along with let's get into her podcast, I guess. So let's see what she has to say regarding all these Vanderpump news people in the press. I'm not talking, I don't know if she's going to actually talk about like 
it being in the press during the season that we see on the air because what we are seeing throughout the season, yeah, they were in the press a whole lot. I got everything saved to be able to show you guys as we go through if she's talking about within the season, like the whole dog situation, like Tahoe taking a picture with Tom and Sheena having her arm around him, all of that juicy, juicy details. I have saved that. I've talked about it. It's things I've already discussed here. So if she's talking about that, that will be interesting to hear. If she's talking about new news that's in the press, well, we will be talking about it as well. And I do have videos coming with you about legal actions between Tom and Ariana and a lot of other juicy news for you as well. So I think I've blabbed enough. So let's get into Rachel's podcast episode number 11. I am going to title this because in my eyes, this is chapter 11. How are you just not going to name it chapter 11, Vanderpump Rules, You're So Vain? Well, we are going to name it for you. So here it is, guys. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel. All right, let's get into it. Hey guys, it's Rachel Savannah Levis, your host of Rachel Goes Rogue. Woo! We are going rogue today because I have a lot to say on what's happening with the show, how often they're using my name, and hot topics on, of course, Tom Sandoval and his most recent endeavors. And I feel like I just want to rant a little bit. I know you guys are reading the same stories that are out this week about no other but Tom Sandoval. He did a New York Times magazine article called How Tom Sandoval Became the Most Hated Man in America. And he's getting a lot of flack for it. I know you guys know exactly which parts have gone viral from it. But if you read this whole article, it is very interesting to say at the least. So, of course, I'm going to bring you the New York Post article called How Tom Sandoval Became the Most Hidden Man in America. He turned last year's season of Vanderpump Rules into the best in reality TV's history and ruined his life in the process. So, let's take a look at the post. It is a long article, so strap in. Let's get to it. So it begins by starting with Valley Village is a Los Angeles neighborhood just across the freeway from Studio City near the southern edge of the area locally referred to with both affection and desire as the Valley. There at the end of a quiet leafy street of a ranch style home stands what real estate agents have come to describe as a modern farmhouse, which its current occupants, the reality TV stars Tom Sandoval, has outfitted with landscaping lights that route in a spectrum of colors mimicking the dance floor of a nightclub. The home is both his private residence and an occasional TV set for the Bravo reality show Vanderpump Rules. After a series of events that come to be known as Scandaval, paparazzi had been camped outside, but by the new year, it was just one or two guys, and now have mostly gone too. Scandaval is the nickname for Scandaval's affair with another cast member, which he had been behind the backs of the show's producers and his girlfriend of nine years. This wouldn't be interesting or noteworthy, except that in 2023, after being on the air for 10 seasons, Vanderpump was nominated for an Emmy for Outstanding Unstructured Reality Program, an honor that has never been bestowed on any of the network's housewife shows. That's pretty damn impressive, I will say that. It also became, by a key metric, the most watched cable series in the advisor's beloved demographic of 18 to 49 year olds and brought in over 12.2 million viewers. That is a lot of people watching Vanderpump Rules. I've always watched it. I've always loved it. And I think that last season blew up for sure. And it was absolutely ama amazing to witness and watch all like the hard work kind of finally pay off, though it was a tragic situation. These people have been 
working their ass off to do something with their lives. And I think that it, it was finally recognized because of this hard time and this horrible incident. This happened last spring when Hollywood's TV writers went on strike and cable TV was declared dead. And our culture had already become so fractured that it was rare for anything, let alone an episode of television, to become a national event. And yet you probably heard about Scandival, even if you couldn't care less about who those people are actually. The story has continued off screen after the season aired. Raquel Levis, which I said it right, I usually say Rachel, with whom Sandoval had the affair, entered a mental health facility in Arizona and started going off by a different name. Ariana Maddox, Sandoval's now ex-girlfriend, garnered so much national sympathy that she has had the most prosperous year of her career. In addition to being invited to the White House Correspondents' Dinner and to compete on Dancing with the Stars, she landed ads with Duracell batteries, Big Razors, Uber Eats, and Lace Chips, as well as starring role in Chicago on Broadway this winter. Actually, right now as we speak. Sandoval, meanwhile, became the most Revile man in America and the butt of a million jokes. Jennifer Lawrence made fun of his skin. Amy Schumer called him a narcissist. I've also called him a narcissist. One of the hosts of The View called him the Donald Trump of ex-boyfriends. And Sandoval has just been here in the valley trying to process it all. I feel like I got more hate than Danny Masterson, he told me. And he's a convicted rapist. Um, wow. What a comparison. And that is not something you can compare because, honey, you do not have these protesters outside a restaurant or your restaurant, let's just say it that way, protesting you like they do right now in the anti-Scientology community, which if you do not see those IRL streams of the people going to the Scientology centers and protesting, they're very, very interesting. I will link some channels down below for you, but that is um, a hard person to compare yourself to, and I don't think that is true at all. When I arrived at his house, Late last year, Sandoval, who is 41, had just finished working out. He wore a black muscle shirt and a wide headband. His assistant, Miles, was at the dining table sorting through Sandoval's utility bills on two laptops. So this looks to be after Anne was fired. Though it also says late last year, so that would be 2003. I don't know. Maybe that was before Anne? interesting to find out. Maybe he has two assistants. Who knows? You let me know what you think down below. He's basically does anything I don't personally have to do, Sandoval explained. We were just joined by Riley, who's on Sandoval's new publicity team, which has a background in crisis PR. Of course they do. I assumed Riley would be an impediment, but my fears were put to rest when she didn't flinch at the Danny Masterson comment. Well, I did. I can tell you that. That's also because I know what they're doing, and they're literally outside these restaurants protesting, saying, don't go in there. This is where Danny Masterson put a date rape pill in some girl's drink and art her, even though I just said the word anyways. Though I do agree, like, these people have a right to protest. I think it's necessary on some levels, but the intensity and how it is and safety is always a concern. So sometimes it's like the concern is, are these people going to be safe by what they are protesting? And I worry for these people because they seem like uh, really great people. Like I said, I'll link some of their channels down below for you guys. 
But anyways, it continues. Riley is 23, has watched Vanderpump since she was in middle school, and seemed as interested in Sandoval's life as I was. Well, that is very interesting. When Sandoval described how desperate their gnarly national television split, he and Maddox have continued living together separately in separate parts of the five-bedroom home and communicating via assistance. Riley was curious to hear more. So all of her stuff is still here, Riley asked. Well, I guess if she's part of the new publicity team, maybe she's not, like, up to speed with everything in Sandoval's life. But that's kind of funny that she's asking, is all her first stuff still here? I mean, I know she's in New York right now, so. But then again, this says late last year. So this would still be, like, December, November. I don't know when they did this interview, but it was in 2024 when she is now in New York on Broadway. So uh, I'm here. I am speculating. Let's just continue. Sandoval wasn't sure, but he thought Maddox might have finally rented a place. She took the dog and the cat, and I know she wouldn't do that if she wasn't staying somewhere temporarily, he said. Okay, so this must have been during the Airbnb time with Dancing with the Stars, where she had a place during that time. Sandoval wanted to buy out her share of the home, but interest rates are so crazy right now. He was considering getting a roommate to help with the mortgage. At least he thought Maddox was finally open to the idea. It took her a while to not be spiteful about the house, he said. A month after we met, Maddox sued Sandoval in Los Angeles County to force him to sell the home and divide the proceeds. Okay, so we know the time frame. Finally! So they're saying a month after they met with Sandoval. So that would have been December when she did the filing. So this was November. So yeah, she probably was with Dancing with the Stars and the Airbnb and all of that. My tape recorder wasn't on yet and Sandoval wanted to make sure I was getting everything. Do you want me to like record this? Of course I wanted this to record this. I couldn't remember interviewing a public figure as eager to speak into a recording device. But then again, Sandoval is not a typical celebrity, nor is Vanderpump, which is currently airing its 11th season, your typical show. Early reality series like Big Brother and Survivor rotated cast in every season. Shows that didn't like The Hills never lasted this long. Though The Hills has come back now. Even its closest point of comparison, Bravo's Housewives franchise, is more of a weekly cage match in which bloody fighters are retired once they're no longer useful. And Sandoval, the Midwest Bread, son of a firefighter and a marketing executive is not a Kardashian. That's for sure, though. He thinks he is. What I mean is that although reality program has been a dominant part of American culture for over two decades, we've never actually put a regular person on reality TV to live out much of their adult life and gotten to see what happens to them as a result. And I agree there. We have been through a lot with Vanderpump Rules cast members. Contrary to popular misconception, Vanderpump is not about Lisa Vanderpump, a former Bravo housewife. It started as a show about waiters and bartenders who lived in crappy apartments around Hollywood and for the most part wanted to become actors. That dream didn't work out, but they became reality stars instead. For a while, this ruined the show. It became less honest. The cast still worked shifts at a restaurant, but actually they drove nice cars and bought $2 million homes or houses, it says. Once the show stopped pretending that nothing had changed, it turned out that a reality show about reality stars was not any less interesting, and I could agree completely. On the last season alone, there was Scandoval, in which Sandoval, a reality star approaching midlife, proceeded to start a cover band, open a bar, and sleep with Levis, a former beauty queen. Wow, look at all those accomplishments. 
a couple that had been on the show since the first season finally decided to divorce, leading the wife to realize that she may never have kids. And a woman who once bragged that her private jet lifestyle was financed by Randall Emmett, the direct-to-TV film producer, left him and became a breadwinner as she fought for custody of their daughter. Alex Baskins, an executive producer of Vanderpump, developed it as a spinoff of Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, which featured Vanderpump as the owner of several mediocre restaurants. Ooh, interesting. Baskin noticed that Sir, which stands for Sexy Unique Restaurant, indeed had a sexy, unique atmosphere. In 2011, he sent a screenshot of Sir's website with Vanderpump on a throne surrounded by her good-looking staff to Andy Cohen. Uh-oh. Who was then Bravo's vice president for original programming. The network provided a small budget for Baskin to explore the idea. What Baskin found was an incestuous friend group in which everyone was either living or sleeping with one another. Oh, that he did find. It was everything you looked for in a TV show, Baskins told me. It just hit me in the face. At the time, Prestige TV was on the rise and writers' rooms across Hollywood became overly preoccupied with chasing critical approval rather than audience and revenue. In this context, Vanderpump was an appealing alternative. Yes, it looked and acted like reality TV, but at its core, it was more like the great scripted shows of the 90s, and that it was about a group of friends living, dating one another, giving up the hopes of their 20s for the realities of their 30s. Ain't that the truth? It relied on time-tested screenwriting tenets, good, unaccepted stories about original characters going through relatable cycles of jealousy, regret, insecurities, and longing. The show was also a brilliant premise, commercially speaking. The TV business shepherd crowds to the real world business and vice versa. You could watch Scandival and his friends on TV, then drop by and have him make you a pump teeny. Oh, that was for sure awesome. The show's main draw was the cheating scandals, of which there were three by the end of season one, which that was crazy. As the show took place more outside the restaurant, it went through an identity crisis. In 2022, it was further debilitated by the pandemic and the departure of four members of the cast because of past racist incidents, and resurfaced social media posts. By season nine, there were rumors that Vanderpump was on the brink of cancellation. We were hobbying, Baskin told me. That very next season, Scandival dropped into Bravo's lap. The show's producers treated it like a news story. Late on the evening of March 1st, 2023, when principal filming for... The 10th season was wrapped and episodes were already airing. Sandoval was performing a new single with his band when his phone fell out of his pocket. Maddox opened it to discover an intimate recording of Levis. The next morning, Maddox notified the show's talent producers who called the showrunner, who then called Baskins, who called Bravo, which scrambled to approve budgets, so that on March 3rd, crews were pulled off Bravo's sets and cameras were back up to capture the fallout as the cast processed the affair. The resulting footage, which aired in May, is an incredible episode of television. Maddox, with damp hair and puffy, cried-out eyes, says, I loved you when you had nothing! And... That girl is searching for an identity in men. And 
I would have followed you anywhere. I think I did a good job. <laughs> Producers did not put cameras down even as Sandoval screamed at them to stop filming him during subsequent reunion special, which was so brutal that Amy Schumer compared it to the end of the Schindler's List. No one, not Sandoval or Baskins or even the executives at Bravo are quite sure why the season resonated the way it did. Maybe it was that Sandoval had awakened something in everyone who had ever cheated or been cheated on, resulting in endless memes and diatribes on social media, or that the affair landed in the news while the season was airing, turning it into an interactive murder mystery of sorts with viewers searching for clues in earlier episodes, which I know I was one of those people looking through earlier episodes. Now, it is easy to be cynical about these things. Isn't it possible that when faced with the show's uncertain futures, producers got together with the cast and cooked up a cheating scandal? This is a popular conspiracy theory, but Baskins told me that the covert affair and continuing fallout was just to elaborate to manufacture, which I agree. I mean, Raquel left the state, he said. When I asked Sandoval, he insisted that if he was going to script a fake storyline, it wouldn't have been one that destroyed his life. I would have never participated in that, he said willingly. I said, you would have never participated in that willingly since you did technically continue to film the show, right? Willingly, he said. Hell no. At Sandoval's house, he made a cup of tea, and Riley and I were listening to what the past year of his life has been like. The thing with Levis started with what sounded like a midlife crisis. You know, when you just feel like you don't know what's cool anymore, he said, and you're past your prime and a little bit of a joke? Riley nodded. He started to feel as though his best years were behind him. He wanted to feel alive again. He and Maddox had grown apart. He planned to tell her about the affair after the season aired. Yeah, we already heard this one, Sandoval. He didn't want it to play out on the show. When he shouted at producers to stop filming, he couldn't remember another time in the show's history that he'd done so unless he was getting in the shower or something. Um, I remember a time. Do you guys remember a time? I do. Miami girl, stop following me! I remember that part very clearly. <laughs> and he continues with, I just wanted to not feel watched, he said. I wanted to take a breath. We all did too, Sandoval. After he finished filming, he went on tour with his band, Tom Sandoval and the Most Extras. He had to. His bank accounts were overdrawn and he needed the money. Crowds of people came out to hate on him. They showed up wearing t-shirts that said, Cheater! And wear him with a mustache. A name one of his castmates coined. Everywhere he went, People called him a loser <laughs> and screamed Team Ariana at him. <laughs> I mean, I would too, though. I would definitely at least scream Team Ariana. Maybe do my, you're well with a mustache. Because that's kind of, you know, iconic in this day and age. <laughs> When he returned home, there were groups of strangers with cameras at his house who seemed to be making fun of him. On the show, Sandoval had complained about always being the one to replenish batteries and other domestic supplies. Now, as Maddox filmed her various commercial spots at the home, I had it had become a ad copy for Duracell. I buy my own batteries now and Bic razors. I've just started a whole new unclogging chapter in my life. In June, a friend 
sent him a photo of Sweet Lady Jane, a popular bakery in Los Angeles, selling cakes with Sandoval's a liar written in frosting. Now, that was a great joke, though, and I'm sorry that, like, that hurt his feelings, but I thought that was great because the whole Sandoval's a liar, Sandoval's a liar, James Kennedy song, loved it, loved it. Sandoval's friends distanced themselves. His brother asked him to delete photos of them on Instagram. Sandoval says he was asked to stop going into Schwartz and Sandy's, a lounge in the Franklin Village neighborhood that he co-owns. The show's fans tanked the bar's Yelp reviews and were harassing the staff, which I will say, I never condoned any of that. Like, that is just bad. Like, if you're not actually going there, then don't give a Yelp review. And just because you're mad at Tom, you shouldn't be going after his business, especially with other business owners involved. The business did nothing. Somehow, people got Sandoval's cell phone number. I mean, that, that was bound to happen. His phone started ringing at all hours with block numbers, with women pretending to be Levis, and men asking how they could find her. He started to feel as if he were in utter cut gems. The nerve-jolting Sadie Brothers movie in which the protagonist is isolated and on the run. Uh-oh. He got down, like really down. His mind went to some dark places. Friends suggested that he got on um, Wellbutrin, which is a antidepressant medication, for those of you who don't know. In April, he quit drinking, hence the tea he was now sipping. He did it for Levis. When she entered the facility in Arizona, he assumed they would be together once she got out. But then Levis stopped talking to him and hasn't returned his call since June. Wow, that's a long time. So pretty much June to we are in December-ish for this interview of 2023. That's a long time. She never ga even gave me closure, he said. It was really hard. It still messes with me. He even tried reaching out through her publicist, but got no response. When Vanderpump started filming season 11 in June, Sandoval was off doing Special Forces, the reality show on Fox that puts celebrities through pseudo-military training. I'm here because I want to get punished, Sandoval says on the show, because he's dunked in frigid waters and dragged across a field on the former Nickelodeon star Jojo Siwa's back. When Sandoval didn't win the competition, he felt robbed. Of course he did. He thought he did all this work and look at how far he came and he got robbed. <laughs> he thought producers made it look as... Though he got eliminated before Siwa, uh-oh, that's a no-no, who voluntarily withdrew. They said she lasted longer than me, he said, but she most definitely did not. He was convinced that producers didn't want him to win. Who did they want to win, Riley asked, incredulist. In the fall, he thought things might finally be turning. He started his own podcast and titled it, Everybody loves Tom. An earlier guest was Dr. Drew, who dug into Sandoval's childhood trauma and declared him not a narcissist. Okay, Dr. Drew. I heard what you had to say about Trisha Paytas, too, and I don't agree there either. But anyways, at least as far as the DSM-5 is concerned, the actor Jerry O'Connor came on and apologized for having t-shirts made that said Team Ariana. I mean, he was um, apologizing, but he was also nice to you, too. I will give you that. He said I he was all Team Ariana. He didn't care, but he did apologize. Um, but the following <laughs> month at BravoCon, the annual Las Vegas convention for the network superfans, Sandoval arrived on stage to booze from... The 8,000 member audience. Well, yeah, because they're so upset. I asked Sandoval why he thought the scandal got so big. 
I'm not a popular cultural historian, really, he said, but I witnessed the O.J. Simpson thing and George Floyd and all those big things, which is really weird to compare to compare this to that. I think, but do you think in a weird way it's a little bit the same? Actually, no, I don't actually. I don't think that's the same, though I get what you are trying to compare it to, like how everyone was kind of all into the O.J. Simpson trial and then everyone was into the George Floyd thing and the protests and everything going on and then how everybody, you know, last year was all into scandal. I can see where you are trying to compare that to, but I don't think that's necessarily the same. What do you guys think? Let me know down below. I looked over at Riley, who was typing furiously on her phone. I think I knew what he meant. He was trying to express the odyssey of becoming the symbolic center of a na nationwide discussion and a major news story. What he communicated instead was something more honest, which is just how much the experience had made him lose perception. I did what I did because I was in an unhappy place in my life, he said. I got caught up in my emotions and fully fell in love, like for real. <sighs> he sighed and drained his teacup. Then he got up, put on some upbeat music and went upstairs to get ready for a night out. Sometimes he says too much, Riley said, and the following day forgets what he says. Then she went upstairs to have a quick word with him. The next day, I was supposed to attend the taping of one of Scandival's, <laughs> Scandival's, Sandoval's confession interviews for the show. That's what happens when you use their last name. I was about to get in my car when I received a text from his publicist, Riley's boss. Okay, so Riley's boss. He'd rather you don't attend today, it read. He's not feeling the best. The next morning, I got a call from Baskins, and the day after that, a Bravo publicist rang me late on Friday. Some of what Scandival, I said it again, Sandoval had said had gotten back to Bravo, and everyone was concerned. What was it that he said about O.J. Simpson and George Floyd exactly? Maybe Sandoval wasn't ready for this. The Bravo publicist asked if I really needed to see Sandoval again. Could the network facilitate an interview with one of the show's other stars, maybe? Question mark, you know, I don't know. Bravo said it would get back to me about next steps. While I waited, I thought about Sandoval. When you're lost, sometimes it's helpful to go back to the beginning. Sandoval arrived in Los Angeles in 2004 with the hopes of becoming an actor. When he was growing up in St. Louis, it was all he wanted to be. I love to pretend, he told me and Riley. I loved it more than sports. At 15, he started modeling. He briefly lived in Miami, then swamp hubbed of a male model where he was photographed by Bruce Weber, for one of his infamous Abercrombie and Fitch campaigns. You know, maybe one of those Abercrombie and Fitch bags I probably had back in 2002, you know. Probably. Maybe. In Los Angeles, he worked as a pool boy at the Mondoran Hotel and as a cater waiter while booking ad campaigns for Rock and Republic, Ed Hardy, Von Dutch, the early Ada brands, that are apparently coming back now. Ah, oh, Von Dutch. I love that brand, Riley said. <laughs> Didn't we all? I had a versatile look, Sandoval explained, because I could do this, this, like, daddy doesn't love me, an emo look, and I could do a more slick back look. Oh, you just had all the looks, Tom Sandoval. Yes, you did. He signed up for Vanderpump Rules because he thought people should see what it's like being an L.A. actor, a model actor. Like driving down the 405, he said, changing clothes, comp cards, and headshots splayed all over my back seat. 
When the show became known instead of for his ex-girlfriend sleeping with his best friend, Jax Taylor. Sandoval didn't mind. When I punched Jax, he said, that sent it into the stratosphere. Ah, maybe. Riley remembered watching that episode with her middle school friends. I don't think in middle school you should have been watching that. We were like, this show is epic, she said. <laughs> I could just see her saying, this show is epic. <laughs> and of course, Sandoval says, dude, it was. It was so cool, Riley said. A decade later, Sandoval, who had a boyish innocence about him in those early seasons, has morphed into a unique Los Angeles species. He's late to everything, his publicist never seems to be able to reach him, and his face has that taunt sheen that celebrities get from anti-aging protocols. <laughs> they described him perfectly. He talks about his life not in years, but in seasons and episodes. Sometimes he pauses mid-sentence and stares into the middle distance like a doll who's wind up Key has jammed. Oh boy, sounds like um, Rachel. Until whatever ambulance, helicopter, or other sound interfering entity has passed. And then he continues as if nothing happened, even when there are no mics or cameras on him. The ceiling lights in his home are taped over with sheets of paper to diffuse light and make it optical for filming. He used to remove them during the off-season, but now he doesn't bother. We leave them up there because otherwise they'll just do it again, he said. Sandoval can't always tell if he's living for himself or the show or both. Sometimes he really has to talk to his best friend and co-star, Tom Schwartz, but he knows he shouldn't via text. So he will call producers and ask how quickly they could have cameras on him to film it. He feels terrible when he has to bring up something that he knows could be damning to his castmates. Yeah, okay, Tom. But that is part of the job. The worst thing Sandoval says you can hear while filming is the dread. Hey, can I talk to you for a minute? That's when you know you're about to be called out for something. Baskins calls this hyper-reality. In real life, you might go to a dinner party and then go home and gossip about your friends. On a reality show, you're encouraged to say those things in the moment. Sandoval is so well-trained at <laughs> narrating his innermost thoughts out loud that he sometimes has to remind himself not to do it outside of filming. You lose track of what a normal conversation would be like with people that aren't on the show, he said. Despite the year he had, he told me that he was really honored to be on Vanderpump. The scandal has made the show so big, it's kind of cool and crazy, he said, even though it's negative and at my expense. Unlike actors, reality show participants are not protected by the Screen Actors Guild, at least not for unscripted work, meaning they're not entitled to residential or union pay minimums. When Sandoval joined Vanderpump, each cast member made 10000 for the entire first season. Today, the original cast makes close to 35000 per episode. That's pretty damn good. Here, I'll put this in a perspective for you, for you guys to understand. I just did, took out my calculator. <laughs> $35,000 times, say, 12 episodes is $420,000. So almost a half a million dollars for a season, let's say. As the genre has grown, participants can make almost as much from other revenue streams like books, podcasts, and brand partnerships, some of which can pay upward of $250,000, which that sounds right. Because of this, what's good for Vanderpump is generally good for Sandoval, monetarily speaking, even if it can almost make his life more difficult. 
Opportunities often grow directly out of plot lines. When Sandoval and Maddox were bartenders in love, they published a book with a co-author called Fancy AF Cocktails and were hired to mix drinks in sponsored videos for brands like Alka-Seltzer. Since their breakup, their fates have diverged. She's the betrayed woman courageously rebuilding her life while he's the villain endlessly atoning for his sins. Um, You're endlessly atoning for your sins because you don't know how to say, I'm sorry I fucked up. That is not anyone else's fault but your own. In December, Maddox released a new book, Single AF Cocktails, and scheduled events like Live Nation, an evening for bad bitches to promote it, which, oh my god, Single AF Cocktails is so great. I am going to bring that to my memberships when YouTube fixes everything. I'm going to be posting some of the book and going over it with you guys and making some drinks with you all and just having a blast on members on my YouTube channel. So stay tuned for that. Playing up of all this riles the fans and keeps the machines turning. When Maddox said at BravoCon that she still hadn't gotten a meaningful apology from Sandoval and the audience erupted in applause, it reminded me of professional wrestling. You know when the face and the heel talk smack to each other to drive crowds wild? It felt like that. Except that I'm pretty sure that Sandoval is not pretending. Pro wrestling has always been staged, and the audience knew it, but didn't care. But Vanderpump is sort of the opposite. While fans on some levels expect reality TV to be fake and think of Sandoval as just another TV character, it's all very real to him, leaving him trapped inside these storylines indefinitely. Tom Sandoval is Tom Sandoval in Tom Sandoval's life, Baskin told me, adding, Someone might say he is putting on a performance, but he is the performance. His entire existence becomes about processing and talking about what happened. Appearing on Special Forces was part of Sandoval's attempt at a redemption narrative. When he drove to West Hollywood that first night, his Mercedes wound its way through Laurel Canyon and emerged onto Sunset Boulevard, not far from the huge billboard that showed him commando crawling across a rope suspended high above the ground. These are the provision economics of being a reality TV star. If it weren't for Scandoval, Sandoval said, I could have probably gotten on that show, but I wouldn't have been on the billboards. Contestants on Special Forces were reportedly paid several hundred thousand dollars, but for the most part, Sandoval hasn't been able to capitalize on Scandoval as much as he would like. Yeah, we know that. That's why you get mad at everyone else for doing their podcast, right? There are minimal brands that want to be associated with someone who's thought of as a cheater. Sandoval's manager, Ryan Ralph, told me, this winter, Sandoval was hoping to do a residency at Chippendales in Las Vegas, but talk stalled. <laughs> I don't think anyone wants him at Chippendales. <laughs> Sandoval was disappointed. Aw, I'm in really good shape right now. Yeah, we know. He said, adding, It's frustrating because, you know, everyone cashed in. Everyone won on this. The cast, the execs, the network, everyone made so much money. But I try to put it it on myself to make the best opportunity out of it that I can. I don't know if I did that as well as I did, you know, the last couple ones. We pulled up to Tom Tom, a bar and restaurant that Sandoval has invested in, and that is part of Vanderpump Universe, along with Sir, Schwartz and Sandy's, Jax's Studio City, and something about her, a forthcoming sandwich shop that Maddox is opening with another cast member. Yeah, Katie Maloney. For the fans, this landscape is like a Disney world populated by their favorite characters. When I stopped by Sir in August, the food was terrible, but there was a line of people out the door and around the block. 
No matter what part of the restaurant you sat in, you had a view of cameras filming the cast, which seemed to be the point. At Tom Tom, Sandoval gave me an inside tour. There's the men's room, women's room, he said. This table is really cool, but you gotta watch your knees. He took me out back by the trash cans where he said Maddox ripped his chin and split his lip the night she found out about the affair. She beat my ass, he said. Though a representative, Maddox declined to comment on the incident. She has denied tearing the necklace off in the past. Okay, so this was the necklace incident. So now he's claiming that she beat his ass and apparently ripped his chain and split his lip. That's a lot more detail than before, Tom. With the show not in production, the place was quiet, except for a couple drinking wine in the corner and two eager-looking women, one of them who eventually approached. Sorry to bother you, she said, but I just wanted to say this place is awesome. See? Not negative. That was a nice meeting of somebody and Tom Sandoval. We sat at a table and were soon joined by Kyle Chain, a jeweler who appeared on the show and is one of the few people who didn't drop Sandoval as a friend. When I asked what it was like being around him last year, Chan compared it to watching Game of Thrones, in which a character named Theon Greyjoy becomes psychologically broken after being tortured and castrated. Sandoval likes to say that as a reality star, he has to live through each event in his life three times. First, when he's living it. Second, when he's taping confessional moments, confessional months later. And then third, when it airs. And he has to answer to the fans. In the real world, he would be able to heal and move on. But that's different because of it being reality TV time. After season 11 airs, Chan said, You just have to relive it one more time and then you'll be free. A couple of weeks before I met with Sandoval, I visited the offices of Evolution Media in a converted shipping warehouse near the Hollywood Burbank Airport. Bravo, which is owned by NBC Universal, distributes Vanderpump via its cable channel and the streaming service Peacock. But Evolution is the production company on the grounds for Vanderpump as well as others like The Real Housewives of Orange County and Botched. As Baskin showed me around, random objects caught my eye. A can of gasoline, bottles of Tums, and sunblock. A blown-up diagram of the female reproductive system, a top of filing cabinet, and a few moving boxes labeled, Bitch! Exclamation point, exclamation point. The office used to be bustling. In the years leading up to and during the pandemic, streaming was at its peak, and Evolution was considering leasing a third building to keep up with the demand for new content. But the market had changed, and people were working remotely. Now, we just don't need the space, Baskin said. Bravo is one of the few cable networks that still bring in a loyal and affluent audience, but even unscripted programming has not been immune to the constructive currently plaguing the TV industry. In 2007, when the Writers Guild went on strike, networks rushed to greenlight unscripted shows to plug holes in programming, leading to a reality TV boom. In 2023, despite predictions otherwise, the boom never came. Networks and streamers, which already had a stockpiling of program, held on to their cash and their media companies, consolidating into entities like Warner Brothers Discovery. There were similar few buyers in the market. Baskin estimated that when all is said and done, the unscripted business would be roughly two-thirds of what it is. And I do agree there, especially 
with like all the TikTok content, YouTube content, you have Kick, you have all these streaming services, and then you have all of the TV streaming services like, you know, Peacock, Hulu, all of that, that are making so much unscripted kind of shows or even like TikToks, like the Who the Fuck Did I Marry on TikTok, that has become like a whole thing where she talks about who the fuck did she marry and it's become a whole like TikTok programming show of her life where she talks about who she married and how he had this crazy elaborate plan and a lot of red flags. If you haven't seen it, my friends are covering it. I will leave their channels down below. 90 Days on Blast, she's an amazing channel. And my other friend, Huggets, they're both covering this TikTok, who the fuck did I marry? So check them both out if you are onto that. If not, and you want to, it's definitely very interesting. I'll say that. But I can totally see where like, the unscripted business is about two-thirds of what it was from before, for sure. Over the years, various network executives have constantly asked Baskins for their own version of Vanderpump Rules. Baskin would love to find it, which I do think, like, Southern Hospitality is a great Vanderpump Rules kind of like look alike. What do you guys think? I think that's kind of like how Vanderpump Rules started. Everyone working in a bar, they're all friends, they betray each other, they sleep with everybody, they sleep with each other. I mean, Southern Hospitality is exactly like Vanderpump Rules when it started, which Alex does say, but it doesn't necessarily exist, he told me. Not that others haven't tried. There was ease what happened to the Abbey about the bar a few doors down from Tom Tom and MTV's Lindsay Lohan Beach Club about the staff at her venture in Moconos. I mean, I haven't seen either of those, but I still think Southern Hospitality is a great like lookalike. Each lasted exactly one season. This spring, Hulu will be premiering Vanderpump Villa yet another attempt to mimic the formula, and Bravo will introduce The Valley, a Vanderpump spinoff featuring some of the cast members who departed the show back in 2020. Jax and Kristen and Brittany. I'm so excited. Baskin told me that in some ways he wished Scandival never happened. The national attention made it much harder to film the show. I will say that. I knew everything that was happening as they were filming. Production always had a few onlookers, but during season 11, paparazzis and fans were everywhere. Yes, they were. While the show was filming in Lake Tahoe, someone snapped a photo of the cast that whipped fans into such a frenzy that it became a plot line on the show. Yeah, because there was a picture of Sheena with her hand around Tom Sandoval's back as they were taking a photo with a fan. I can see where the plot twist happens now in the show because it's coming up as we speak. Producers used to be strict about not breaking the fourth wall, but now they have no choice but to let the outside world into the frame. It used to be that the real show was not that there are people watching a TV show, Baskin told me. But part of Tom Sandoval's real experience in life right now is that he's not just facing an ex-girlfriend or a friend group upset with him. He's facing the entire nation. Ain't that the truth? As filming for the new season got underway, Bravo had a problem. The cast had turned on Sandoval. Maddox refused to interact with him altogether, which I agree. In July, Baskins and the Network brought the cast into Evolution's office for what he called a come-to-Jesus moment, but he was no longer talking to 20-something waiters. We can't still squeeze a great season out of it, he said, but going forward, I don't know. Uh-oh. Come on, Baskins, don't ruin my hopes and dreams. Levis was the only primary cast member who didn't return for season 11. Her team inquired about a pay increase and floated the possibility of Levis's getting a development deal with Bravo. But yet she claims it wasn't about the money. Interesting. I can't wait to see what she has to say about this. Though a representative, Levis 
emphasize the mental health protections were her primary concern. Yeah, of course. Then in August, after spending 90 days in the Arizona facility and changing her name from Raquel back to her birth name, Rachel Levis appeared on Bethany Frankel's podcast. Yes, we know. It's here on my channel. Frankel is a former Real Housewives of New York. Last summer, she declared what she called the reality reckoning, accusing Bravo and other networks of profiting, profiting off a harmful environment created by their shows without properly compensating their stars. She invited others to join her and team up with two predominant attorneys, Mark Duragos and Brian Fetterman. No actual lawsuit has been filed, but... NBC Universal subsequently issued updated guidelines for its production companies, including additional psychological support for cast members. Look at that! Something actually happening. Part of Frankel's arsenal was a three part interview with Levis, who described how she felt exploited by Sandoval and Bravo for ratings without seeing a single penny. Yeah, she was pissed. And it was about the money. Baskin told me that Levis was paid $19,000 per episode for 18 episodes. And that news of the affair came after the season wrapped. That is so true. So how can you get more for that season after the affair came out after the season had already aired and things were already going on? Are we supposed to give her retroactive payment for having a clandestine affair for eight months, he asked? That's very true. So I did some calculations. The original cast makes 35000 per episode, which we know, 18 episodes. So that is over half a million dollars. That's $630,000 for an entire season, which... That makes it only $288,000 less for Rachel because she's making $342,000 on her 18 episodes at $19,000 an episode. To me, I think she's doing very well, especially where the cast, the original cast, have been there for 10 years. And Rachel, she's been roughly on it for five years Though the first few seasons, I would consider more like appearances than actually being like an original star. Like kind of how Ariana appeared on season one, but she wasn't really in season one as like a main star. So I would consider her becoming like part of the original cast from 9 and 10, those two seasons. So that's two seasons, roughly, where you're getting paid per episode kind of a thing. So, in my opinion, I think where she is is right where she should be at the 19,000 an episode. Especially if you think back on season one, they were only making 10,000 for the entire season, which I know there was less episodes, all of that, but 10000 for the entire season where she is making 19 an episode. She's doing very well for herself. So her asking for more money is crazy, especially to they already had a contract in place for season 11, and that's something that they do after season 10 which season 10 was still airing when the contracts went out for season 11. And that's when she said she wanted more money because the affair had just come out. It's crazy. So it continues with, Frankel would basically argue, yes, as a SAG member went on strike in July, joining the writers, she called for reality stars to unionize so they too can collect residential and benefits after the fact from a successful season. But while everyone I talked to agreed that regulations would be a good thing, no one was sure how it would work exactly. Part of the appeal of reality TV is that 
It's relatively cheap to make, as low as about 250000 per episode first $2 million for a scripted TV show. The draw for all parties involved is that its stars are often plucked from relative obscurity. It's probably good for the business to have some protections, revealed Sandoval's manager that they told me. Will it happen? I don't know, but no one is walking off set. I didn't see Sandoval for about two weeks. Then on a Monday in December, I drove to a soundstage in Burbank where he was taping his next confessional interview for the show. Riley wasn't here this time. Instead, we were joined by a Bravo publicist and Erica Forstrat, and I probably got her last name wrong, a senior NBC Universal executive. My clue that this wasn't typical was when Erica introduced herself to Sandoval. You once made me a wonderful mocktail at Schwartz and Sandy's, she said. Sandoval was in a small dressing room applying dabs of makeup to his forehead. Of course he was. In front of him were three caffeinated beverages, a Red Bull, an iced coffee, and a Dr. Pepper. He sipped each immediately. Sandoval said he was feeling depressed. He said the same thing the last time I saw him. When I asked if he, if the depression was show-related, he had said, somewhat show-related, just life, business stuff, it's hard. Sandoval began to perform loud vocal exercises. He applied pomade to his hair, combing it back with his fingers, and changed into a light blue women's suit from Zara, which he said he preferred to the store's menswear. The suit looked good, but the sleeves barely reached his wrists. As he emerged from the dressing room, there was something about the suit's feminine cut combined with Sandoval's physique and slightly hunched posture that reminded me of Heath Ledger's Joker in the scene at the hospital where he wears a nurse's uniform. Oh my god, that's kind of funny that he compares it to that scene. It's hard to tell how Sandoval feels about filming the show. Sometimes he sounded down on it. It has its fun moments, but for the most part, it sucks. I've been buzzed throughout most of it. Other times, he's told me he wouldn't do it for as long as he possibly could, which he will do it for as long as he possibly can. There was a point last year when he considered quitting, but he was glad he didn't. He wasn't at all envious of Levis, who walked away from the cameras, albeit not very far, as she has started her own podcast. Oh, we know. Rachel Goes Rogue. So far, the primary theme has been Scandaval. Funny, because she doesn't think that her primary theme has been Scandaval. If you ask, I believe, Rachel, she will tell you it's bringing awareness and giving her side to everything that's happened on Vanderpump since she can't be there for Vanderpump. So that's the only reason why she's talking about Vanderpump. I mean, that's what Rachel says, right? Sandoval figured she would be back in a season or two. What else is she going to do? Great question, Sandoval. What else is she going to do? I I believe if they give her the chance, she definitely will try to be back because I can't see her doing anything else. I would hope that she would move on from this and do something more with her podcast. That's my opinion. But I really, at this point, with everything I've seen, I don't know what she's going to do or what she plans on, but if she wants to get away from all this drama, then she needs to do something else and change her podcast format into something better, in my opinion. The evolution set where confessionals are taped is designed to look like another room in Sir. There are deep purple curtains, a mirror dresser, and lots of gold and velvet. Production for the new season wrapped in September, but interviews are taped for months afterward to get the cast reaction to what occurred. The showrunner began by asking Sandoval about a tasting lead by a water sommelier? Never heard of that. 
that everyone attended in August. Had had Sandoval ever heard of a water tasting? Good question. Sandoval had hoped his luck would turn this season. It probably is why he agreed to speak with me in the first place. When I last talked to him, he was feeling optimistic. He'd been meditating and was about to go back on tour with his band. Plus, he was single now, which could be a whole new storyline for him on the show. It's the first time I've ever been single as a celebrity, he told me. Oh, as a celebrity. I'm not saying I'm a favorite celebrity, but still ha- just having some notoriety and being single, it's a cool muscle to flex. Oh, it's such a cool muscle to flex. He kind of sounds like a fuckboy. What do you guys think? Though he had come to Los Angeles to be an actor, he was proud of what he became instead. Did he become the next Brad Pitt? No. But he didn't want to be that anymore anyway. It turned out reality TV is where the real stakes are. Actors were just pretending. Play roles. I had no respect for reality TV before, Sandoval told me. And now I don't have very much respect for actors. I'm like, y'all try doing this. I mean, it is a lot different than actors and reality TV stars. I will say that. I will give him that. Of course, he knew it wasn't going to last forever, but if he kept at it and rehabilitated his image, there could be life beyond his first show. There were band deals to be had, as well as reality spinoffs and competition shows. Though if he was going to do anything reality series, he would like it to be something more feel-good. Our show can be toxic to film, he said, and very stressful. Despite this, he was as committed to it as ever and hoped it would continue for a while. As long as people are interested, he told me, and we're being honest in our feels. Yeah, in our feels. I'm not too sure how honest he really is with his feels. That's what he was doing now, sitting in front of the camera in a powdered blue suit and sunless tanner, being honest in his feels. I watched him on a monitor as he peered into the lens with one eyebrow slightly raised. Then the cameraman rolled and his face lit up with a big, genuine smile. And that, my friends, is the New York Post article and where it ends. So, now that we got that out of the way, let's get back into Rachel's podcast because she goes into this article. She has a lot to say about this article. So, everything we just talked about will be mentioned now in her podcast. Let's get back into it. There's a few takeaways for me. One of them just really showing how Tom is living in this hyper reality state. I think we can all agree that Scandaval doesn't even come close in comparison with OJ Simpson or George Floyd. These were tragedies, one in which sparked a huge movement. I know all of you guys are thinking the same thing. It goes to show that Tom is really in his own reality. Let me quote this. It says, Sandoval can't always tell if he's living for himself or the show or both. Sometimes he really has to talk to his best friend and co-star Tom Shorts, but he knows he shouldn't via text. So he will call producers and ask how quickly they could have cameras on him to film him. I think this is really interesting because this is actually something that Tom Sandoval has prepped me to do. When I was still new to filming, he taught me when we're filming a TV show, it is the most effective when we have the conversation on camera for the first time, because that's when we can really show our true emotions and how we are actually feeling. But if you have that conversation off camera, then you're going to have to recreate that conversation for camera purposes, and you'll have to fake your emotion. So wait to have those real talk conversations for on camera. But then like talk about the weather or whatever it might be that's not important for off camera. 
Now, I do agree with Rachel that him comparing Scandal to the O.J. Simpson trial and George Floyd are two completely different situations. I said that then, I'm saying it again. I think, yes, he lives in his own reality. And in the sense, too, Scandal was a big thing for a lot of people. So though it does not compare because you lost two people... It compares in the sense that people were so invested, like they were invested in the trial and watching it and seeing everything that happens and watching the George Floyd thing and watching what happens and the protests and everything afterwards. It's that kind of a comparison. The investment that people had is, I think, where he's trying to compare it. And I can see where she's coming from, where they just don't compare. I also think her explaining how Tom used to prep her exactly for this, where to have these hard conversations on camera, but then have the, like, non, you know, interesting conversations off camera. I think that anyone in reality TV knows that that is something that can happen and might happen where they might have to relive a conversation that they already had this time, though, on camera. And when you are in production, I do think that maybe, yes, if you want to have these hard-hitting conversations, wait till there's a camera. You know that you're in production. You know that you're taping. You know that these are things that are happening as they're happening. So let them happen naturally in front of the camera that first time instead of having to then redo it and kind of be fake in that sense. I don't think this is like some like weird trick of the trade that you know, it's some kind of a secret. I think this is something we all comprehend and they comprehend. And I think that he was kind of being helpful to her, though I do can see where he's a, you know, a sneaky snake and he likes to kind of rehearse things too. So I'm surprised that he didn't rehearse what they wanted to say in front of the camera because that's something that Sandoval always did was kind of rehearse or think about it in the sense too much in his mind that he knows how he's going to play it out when it happens. Those are my opinions. Let me know what you guys think down below in the comments. You know I love hearing what you guys have to say. It is really bizarre if you think about it because it's like, yes, this show creates a base for these huffer conversations that are real in the moment, but it's reality TV. So you could see how that can get very complicated. The article is really interesting because it kind of demonstrated and painted a picture for us of how the effects of reality TV is impacting a regular person. In fact, I'll pull a quote from the article where the writer said, although reality programming has been a dominant part of American culture for over two decades, we've never actually put a regular person on reality TV to live out much of their adult life and gotten to see what happens to them as a result. So this is interesting to me because it's kind of like an experiment. I think there was reference also to other shows where cast members would come on for a short duration of time and then they would be off of it and deal with whatever backlash that they would receive from being on that season, process through that, and then it would be over unless they like did another show like Bachelor in Paradise or something. But in Vanderpump Rules, this is a recurring cast I had to stop her because she totally missed the point. She missed the mark here with this one. So yes, they do talk about how with this reality show, this is like the longest one that's been running where they can actually see kind of where people have gone from their 20-somethings to their 30-somethings now into their 40s and see what reality TV impact has had in their life. I will give her that. But then she moves on to saying, well, then I think they said something about this? No, this is what they said. They said that over the years, they had asked Alex Baskins to try to reproduce this, and it's kind of something that they tried with E, with what happens at the Abbey, about a bar a few down doors down from Tom Tom, and MTV's Lindsay's Low Hand Beach Club, about the staff at her venture, in the Moconos. It said each lasted exactly one season. This spring, Hulu will be premiering Vanderpump Villa, yet another attempt to mimic the formula. 
and Bravo will introduce The Valley, a Vanderpump spinoff featuring some of the cast members who departed the show in 2020. And then it goes in from there about how, like, Baskins wished Scandal never really happened and all of that stuff, which we already read about Lake Tahoe and filming and how it was hard to film and yada, yada, yada. So she missed the mark and tried to make that other part that she heard, which she didn't hear correctly, into, well, see, then they had to deal with backlash after that season unless they got into something else. No, that's not what happened. Uh, uh, yi, yi. Sometimes with this girl, like, I just need to breathe a little bit. And I'm, I'm trying to be as unbiased as possible. But she has been making me so mad lately that this just frustrates me a little bit. It's like, if you're going to quote the article, then quote it right the second time too. Because clearly all you had to do was just scroll down a bit and you could have read and realized it didn't fit the narrative you were trying to spin. You know, it's been 11 seasons now, so at least over 11 years of these people's lives, you know, including my own. My whole 20s were on this show. And I think it just goes to show that your reality can be so skewed. And if you don't have strong boundaries in place of like, okay, I know exactly who I am and I know that this is a job that we're here to do, it still gets so messy because it's like, when does your job become just the job and not your real life? At a certain point, you're living for the storyline on the show. (sighs) It's just very complex. And I think this article really captures I don't disagree that it's not complex. I don't disagree that we don't know the effects of how reality TV throughout the decades can affect someone's life. I think this is a great, in a sense, social experiment where they can now look back and see how someone is affected by being on a reality TV show for decades and decades and how that can impact their life. Like, I think, like, I used to take a sociology class in college, and this would be a perfect sociology experiment in that sense, where they see the interaction of people and how they interact with groups and the setting and setting and how that is affected and how that affects the group and all of that. I think this would be a great experiment. I think it's good to see for future reality TV. Like I said, I think we are in a generation where we do a lot of reality based shows videos tiktoks all of that and we are more in that sense of everybody's living their own reality whether it be in a tiktok a video a vlog all of that good stuff so it's a great experiment to then kind of broaden the horizons to seeing with the impacts on people's mental health in a situation like this and can maybe then implicate some good precautions for future endeavors. I believe one of the things like Rachel said was like they made sure to make sure there was as much alcohol as possible that we wanted if we wanted it. So eliminate maybe that. Maybe stop them from drinking at say 10 o'clock. Technically they're working. Technically, when you're working, are you allowed to drink on the job? No. So maybe do things to eliminate issues, but also just let them live their reality still. I think it's very telling to be able to to see their lives through the decades and see just how they grew as a person. And that's also why we've come to love a lot of these people and cared a lot about the situation when Scandal happened because we were invested in them for so many years together. And it was hard to see it end. It's like seeing, you know, your parents possibly get a divorce in that sense. Like, it was heartbreaking for a lot of people. I do think, though, with this, that there can be now precautions put in place for future reality shows that they can take this as a prime example and use that to further benefit the reality TV world. What do you guys think? Let me know down below. How that is playing out in a long-term way for everybody to see. I was mentioned in the article a few times. It says, in April, he quit drinking, hence the tea he was now sipping. He did it for Levis. 
When she entered that facility in Arizona, he assumed that they would be together once she got out. But then Levis stopped talking to him and hasn't returned his calls since June. She never even gave me any closure, he said. It was really hard. It still messes with me. He even tried reaching out through her publicist, but got no response. And I'm not sure if we talked about this yet, but I do remember that phone call that, you know, he was really trying to get me on the phone and said he had important info and he would only share it if I was on the phone. Obviously, that's manipulative. And that conversation was wild, but I didn't respond because I'm trying to stay in reality. And I know his priorities are the show. And it it even got so confusing for me when I was hanging out with him. I feel like people are starting to see like how this show has affected Tom and his reality. And now they're saying like, oh, Tom should take a year off. He needs to process through this. And I'm like, yeah, people like that's why I didn't come back. But I think other people are starting to see that, too. They're like, oh, I can see why Raquel didn't come back to do this show because there's no way it is good for mental health. I'm glad that people are starting to see it and starting to connect the dots because that was a huge issue for me. It was like, there's no way I could go back to the show and have some sort of real reality. My thing with Rachel is this. When she first joined Vanderpump Rules, she knew what she was kind of signing up for. She had knew, known about James. She was following his DJing so she could get close to him, so she could, you know, join the show. She even said that. And we can dispute this, too, in the comments if you'd like. But she did know what she was getting herself into. I do also believe that it was a great decision of hers to not come back for this season. I do think her mental health is a big factor in this. I'm glad that she got everything in order. And I do remember being her age, living my real life, and not having a goddamn clue in the world what to fucking do either. And if I didn't get the help that I needed when I wanted it, I wouldn't be where I am today. And even though she is not on this show, she needs to live in her own reality. If she does not want to be a part of this, then she needs to close that chapter. And to me, rehashing it is reliving it. And she is not closing that chapter. I think she is not mentally capable at this moment of closing that chapter. And that's something in her that won't let it go. And I understand Two, like people talking about you and wanting to clear your name. I get all of that. I'm also the type of person that if people hear lies about me, they can ask me about it. They can come to me. And if they don't want to get to know me for me, then that's their loss. I'm going to continue to be me and hopefully they will see me for who I truly am. I think for her benefit, her leaving the show at her age, Getting her priorities in order is something that she needed to do. And I'm not faulting her at all or any of that. I think it's a wonderful decision. But as Tom also asked in this interview, what else is she going to do? What is her next step? Because right now with this podcast, all she keeps doing is rehashing Vanderpump Rules. She wants to still be in that situation because she keeps putting herself in that situation. It's not really to clear her name when she was bringing them up before the show even started to air this season. My opinion is she just needs to let go. You stop talking to Tom. You stop talking to everybody that was part of the cast. Close the door. Don't watch the show. Don't watch what they have to say regarding what happened last summer after everything because you kind of already know and move on do something that you want to do you sit here and you want to advocate for mental health then advocate for it talk about your experience what you're going through currently now that you've been out of the facility you're back in reality you have like the show now airing talk about your mental health and what you're going through don't keep talking about the show that is just how I feel and I hope that maybe she does hear this and she can understand what I'm trying to say. I get it, dude. I get it. I get being that age, not knowing what to do, where your life is going to take you. 
And then sitting down with a therapist and kind of working it all out and figuring it all out and still not knowing what you wanted to do. And you just kind of go with the flow of life and you just keep pushing forward and doing the things you want to do and eliminating the things you don't want. It's a beautiful feeling. But I will also say real quick too, with real life, you're going to be unsure just like you're going to be unsure with reality TV. You don't know where it's going to take you. And you just need to keep pushing forward and be the best you that you can be. Now let's talk about something that stood out to me watching episode four. I thought it was interesting in this episode how when Lisa gave Graham to James, she never said my name. She didn't say that story that was put out in the press of me surrendering my dog to kill shelter and it was hours away of being euthanized. And I thought that was very interesting because I was like, oh, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. And I'm pleasantly surprised. I'm a little bit relieved because now I don't have to worry about more death threats and death wishes. I don't know if that scene was reshot so that she could backtrack after being called out on it or if that was the original thing and she just let those rumors run rampant because it was like propaganda to make me look like this ultimate villain. But I'm glad that I called her out on it and put the real story out there because my family was in contact with the foster that was training and taking care of Graham. And so we actually did know like the story of how Lisa adopted Graham. And I think she realized that we had so many facts that we published to the press that she was going to have to change her story. Now, if I recall correctly, it was not Lisa Vanderpump that said the dog was hours away from being euthanized. It was actually an article that said it. And they were not quoting anybody. They were stating this as what they had heard from a source. Now, we do know, and this is something that Alex actually has spoken on the BravoCon panel and also in other interviews that he has done, that there were a lot of speculation and rumors that happened that they never had to deal with before because they never had people and paparazzi like they had around before this season after everything happened. So yeah, maybe they did let the story just live on its own and have the show play out the way it was gonna because People are going to speculate, and especially when you're in filming, you can't just be like, no, 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 that's not really what happened, this is what happened, and that, 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 that. Then you're giving away the storyline and the story as it's going to unfold on TV when it airs. So yeah, maybe the press was not giving factual information out because they didn't have the facts. Maybe they were speculating. I don't think that Lisa ever said that the dog was hours away from being euthanized. I think this is something that Rachel believes because she read it. But Lisa, from every video that I've ever seen, never said that dog was hours away from being euthanized. I do know she made comments to TMZ, and I have those videos. I just watched some of them, and she didn't say anything about that there either. I did do a What's Up with Vanderpump where you can see a lot of the the behind-the-scenes filming of Season 11, and I will link that down below because I do talk a lot about Lake Tahoe and the events that happened there and Graham and that whole situation. So check that out if you haven't. It kind of goes over where we are right now in the season. We've also heard from the fans watching that have been following since all of this happened and been following filming that they witnessed Graham being reunited with James in Tahoe specifically. So I wonder how they're going to transition all of that. So it will be interesting to see. I'm just relieved that she's not running with that narrative. You know, some people still don't understand, like they say, oh, I should have just gone back to do the show if I'm going to be commenting on it. You know, the only reason why I'm commenting on it is because they're talking about me and I'm not there. And I'm not going to let them run with these fabricated lies that paint me in a horrible picture. And I'm glad I spoke up about the truth because it did change the trajectory of this season and how the Graham situation played out. I truly believe that. Again, these were just articles putting out what they were speculating from what they were seeing is that Graham was reunited with James in Lake Tahoe because of the pictures. 
Come to find out, he was reunited with him before Lake Tahoe, and we saw that in the season. These were the things the cast kept saying, you gotta wait till the season to see, because things like that were happening. There were articles being put out with speculations to things being said and happening and all that. We saw that with Sheena and Sandoval when they were talking outside of Sir. There were reports where they were filming, yes, and that Sheena was screaming at Sandoval behind Sir and something major had happened. And come to find out, it was a sit-down conversation that just didn't end very nicely. So it was articles like that that were speculating to what was already happening in season 11 while they were filming before we got to see. And yeah, production let it run. They're not going to sit there and say, no, that's not what happened. That's not what happened. Because then they're giving away what's going to happen in the new season. Why would they do that? They're going to let people speculate. And I'm glad that she got to clear her name with the whole Graham situation because it didn't look very good at all. And in my opinion, it still doesn't look very good at all. I just, I don't know. I would never be able to do that. There's got to be more that could be done, in my opinion. If that is your animal, your pet, your responsibility, and you need to take care of that. If the dog keeps doing something, you need to then try and fix that situation, whether it's more training, more getting used to being active around other people in situations and all of that. There are things that can be done, and I don't think that she was in her right state of mind to be able to do that at that point. But she didn't do all that she could for that dog. And that is just my opinion. But the one thing that keeps bothering me is that she says, the only reason I'm talking about it is because they keep talking about me and I'm not even there. What did you expect? You just had an affair for seven months. Then that came out to the public. And then a couple months later, they picked up filming when the whole scandal process was still happening. You are going to be brought up because you are part of the equation. You were the key point in that affair. You and Sandoval. So for you not to expect that your name is going to be brought up all season is just ridiculous in my opinion. And stupid. How do you not expect this? She also knows that this is something that was June, July, August when they were filming and things were happening. She read all the tabloids to know, clearly. So why isn't she moving past this? I get like coming on, you know, in the beginning of your podcast and be like, well, this happened. I want to clear this up. This happened. This was said. I want to clear that up. And then moving on. Why do you harp? She harps on it. That's what I don't get. I wanted to discuss some of the VPR headlines of this week because there have been many. And with my iHeart producers, they have some questions and I have lots of thoughts. So let's get right into it. So you were talking about mental health and you were talking about the idea that reality TV can be a really hard environment to thrive in. This week, we saw the topic of mental health come up on the episode where Lisa is asking Sheena and Lala to kind of ease up on Tom and give him a little bit of grace. Now, what we saw play out was the weight of that on the other cast members. Ariana this week has come out to say she thinks that if Lisa notices someone is struggling, it is her job to provide mental support and she shouldn't be putting that ask on the cast members. Where do you stand on this? I agree with Ariana. I think that Lisa should be the one to advocate for Tom Sandoval's mental health if she's concerned about it. And getting like serious attention would be a good thing. Um, especially if you're concerned with somebody who has very dark thoughts. I think that putting that and having that scene on camera, talking to Lala and Sheena about it is like, okay, now we're, are we just using Tom's mental health as a storyline for the season? And to get Tom Sandoval back in the group by talking some sense, air quotes, into Sheena and Lala. Because if that's the case, I just feel like, yeah, that's unfair to Sheena and Lala to carry that burden if something were to happen. It feels icky. Like, it feels exploitative. 
it feels icky. Oh my God. I just, I, I, I don't get her. But what I feel about this week's episode and Lisa, you know, going to Lala and Sheena and saying, you know, be easy on Sandoval. He's going through some things. Is it Lisa's job to get him mental health help? I know she is a producer on the show and it is part of production's job. But technically, she's a producer when it comes to, yes, being there to help with the show, like putting it together and does it look good? Yeah, okay, that looks good, go. She's not the one to actually go seeking the information needed for cast members. She should, yes, go then to the other producers and production that takes care of this in the show and say, listen, we need to get him into some treatment. Something needs to happen. We need to do something. Even if it's going then to Lake Tahoe and having a retreat where they do some counseling and some therapy and some group therapy. That's all good things. I don't think she's using... Tom's mental health as a storyline, I think that's going to, yes, be his storyline because it's the aftermath of everything he did to himself and how he's dealing with it. That is his storyline. This is his reality. Mental health plays a part, yes. I think these are good things to see, especially with the decades and decades of seeing these people live their lives on a reality TV show and the impacts it has on them. I think it's a great thing. Even when we watched Southern Charm and I saw Austin going to therapy and him talking to his therapist, I thought that was great for everyone to see and recognize. These are good things. Therapy is not a bad thing. And I think Lisa should go to production and see about what they can do to help him, especially if she's that seriously concerned. And I'm glad that she did say something to the girls, though I don't believe his mental health should be on them. And it was just a way of just saying, like, listen, just give the guy a break for just a second. Not forever. Don't you don't have to forgive him. Just give him a little break. He's going through a lot. He just lost his best friend from Mm. I don't even want to say the word because I know YouTube doesn't like it, but he just lost his best friend from mental health issues. And that's also impacting him. That plays a lot on someone's mind and soul, along with everything he's already dealing with. Do I think that he needs a break? I do, but that is up to him. You can only offer so much help. And if that person doesn't want to help themselves... There's nothing really you can do about it, but just keep offering and offering and promising to be there when they need it and want it. If Lisa is actually concerned about Tom's mental health, then maybe she does have a responsibility to get him mental health care, especially with like the disclaimers that keep coming up at the end of the episodes, providing a hotline, which is obviously new this season. It just feels icky. It feels like Lisa is kind of like using Tom's mental health as a storyline, putting some pressure on Lala and Sheena. And I think Ariana's right. Lisa should be getting Tom Sandoval some help. Ariana's also mentioned that she kind of felt similar to what you were saying, where Tom was talking about her mental health on public platforms. Yeah, I recognize that too for every time that I've talked about Tom talking about my mental state and bringing that up on camera or on other people's podcasts. I also recognize that Ariana has been in the same boat as me and never ever is it okay for someone else to be talking about someone's mental state of mind if that has been shared with you in confidence. So it's just very icky that that is still being talked about. Um, for both me and Ariana. Ugh, I just do not like her using the word icky. I just don't get it. Icky? It's icky, guys. It's icky. No, I don't like it. But I can't agree with her, though, that talking about someone's mental state of mind and mental health issues is no one else's place but that person if they want to talk about it. So by someone else bringing up someone's mental state, they can say, you know, she's going through a lot right now and she's getting the help that she needs. They shouldn't be elaborating any further on it. 
They shouldn't be going to people, well, you know, that was like the lowest point of her life and I had to tuck her off an edge like Tom did with Sheena. I think he was, though, maybe he was playing it up for the cameras. I mean, that's very possible. He knew the cameras were running. But I think he also wanted to let her know, like, dude, you really hurt her, too. Like, I get your hurt, but what you said and what you did pushed her to a ledge and cut it out. I mean, it wasn't as direct as how I'm saying it, so I get where she's coming from, I get where Ariana's coming from, where Tom was talking about her mental health. It's not cool. It's not right. No one should do it, especially if you are entrusted by that person. So speaking of Ariana, Tom Sandoval has claimed that he loaned $90,000 to her, and he says that he cannot sell their shared home until she pays him back. So there's so much back and forth between the two of them. Do you think while they're sorting this out, they should still be living together? Um, No, I don't. But like, I have no say in that. I, their finances are between them. And I've asked Tom to move out. Like I provided an apartment for him to stay at when I was at the Meadows. And I asked him to leave the house and find a new place by the time I got back. And he was like, no, that's not happening. So. I don't know what's going on between them because Thomas told me that they're roommates and they're still roommates, even if they weren't quite just roommates before. They definitely are now. Okay. She started off good by saying, you know, their finances is none of my business. I have no room to say anything about this. But then the key word was, but I've talked to Sandoval and he says they're just roommates. So she is making claims now that she has talked to Sandoval. That the last time she claimed to have talked to him was when she was at the Meadows, and that was probably June. But now she's saying that she has talked to him, and he has said they're roommates. So, Rachel, when is really the last time you have talked to Sandoval? Because according to the way you are just spewing this out, I do think you're telling the truth. And that you have spoken to Sandoval. And it wasn't just in June when you never talked to him again. You've talked to him since. So tell us more. Because I think you need to elaborate. And I want to point one more thing out too. She said she got Tom a place when she was at the Meadows. And she had told him that he needed to get out by the time she was out of the Meadows. Um... So, what happened? You clearly said he said no. So, did he leave? Did you have someone evict him? Like, what happened? And it feels a little weird that she's kind of modeling the same situations that she's had with Sandoval, like Ariana's had. Is that weird to you guys, or is it just weird to me? Maybe I'm overthinking this. Let me know. Tom Sandoval very much in the news this week. He was even mentioned on an episode of SNL. Did you see that episode or did you see the mention? I saw the mention, yes. So I didn't want to leave you guys hanging with the SNL comment and what happened there. So let's get into that real quick. So this article says, following last week's controversial New York Times profile, Sandoval became a punching bag over the weekend. He was the butt of jokes on both last week's Tonight with John Oliver and SNL. John Oliver dedicated the second episode of last week's Tonight new season to investigating a surprisingly effective online scam called pig butchering where scammers convince victims to gradually contribute increasing amounts of money in cryptocurrency before leaving with all of their money, similar to fattening a hog before slaughtering. Oliver defended the honor of real pigs, who the Emmy-winning host said are awesome. He continued, They're one of the most intelligent animals on the planet. They're smarter than dogs, most three years old, and Tom Sandoval. It continues with, it's fair. Did Sandoval ever let a border collie adopt him to help the dog deal with the trauma of having their puppies put up for sale? No. Score one for babe. 
on SNL's Weekend Update, a frozen embryo played by... (laughs) Oh, just laughing. A frozen embryo. We already know where this is going. Played by Marcelo Hernandez, popped up to discuss the wild Alabama Supreme Court decision that said frozen embryos are legally people. Okay. The Weekend Update embryo also had no time for Sandoval's <laughs> hijinks telling anchor Colin Just, I don't have a brain. I don't have a heart. I'm like Tom Sandoval. And also threw out that even without eyes, it can see that Tom is a pure narcissist. Oh, look, the embryo agrees with me. Then the article goes into, it's, oh, it's been a year since Sandoval happened, blah, 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 all that good stuff that we already know. I do want to show you, though, the clip. Hopefully, you know, YouTube lets me play the clip. So if it's here, YouTube approved it. Well, this week, the Alabama Supreme Court ruled that a frozen embryo created through in vitro fertilization is a human being. Here to comment is a frozen embryo from Alabama. <laughs> Wow, your accent's kind of all over the place, man. Yeah, I guess I never talked before because I don't have a mouth or throat or lungs. Right, right. And do you even know, like, who your parents are? Uh, no, Colin, but based on my accent and size, I'm going to guess Sofia Vergara and an Oompa Loompa. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess I have to ask, like, as an embryo, do you feel like you're a full human life? Does this look like a life to you, Colin? I'm living at negative 200 degrees in liquid nitrogen, freezing my non-existent nipples off. I don't got a brain. I don't got a heart. I'm like Tom Sandoval. <laughs> <laughs> so you watch Vanderpump Rules? Of course not. I don't even have eyes. But even without eyes, I can see that Tom's a pure narcissist. <laughs> I'm just happy to be out the freezer, Colin. The freezer's like prison. No names, only numbers. I once saw them put my best friend into solitary confinement. Oh, wow. So like a jail cell? A womb. Nine months they had him in there eating out of a tube. And then they transferred him to real jail, Alabama. So previously, you had talked about what it felt like to be on a cover of a magazine, obviously not necessarily for the reason you would want to, but you said it was cool. Do you think Tom Sandoval would think being mentioned on SNL would be cool, regardless of the context? Okay, first of all, when I said it was cool, it was definitely like my thought process in that moment when I received the magazine. So I just wanted to clear that up. I don't necessarily think it's cool now, but I don't know if Tom thinks it's cool. I mean, I think right now he's probably been advised to not speak. And it just seems like every time he opens his mouth, he digs himself a little bit deeper. It's clear that every time he opens his mouth, he digs a little deeper in that hole that he's already in. But I mean, it's Tom Sandoval. And right now we are seeing exactly what everyone else was screaming all summer, that he still cannot take accountability for his actions. And until that is actually happening, he's going to get dragged through the mud. They're going to talk about him. They're going to keep complaining that he just can't apologize for his actions or see what he did wrong. Do you think that with all of these headlines and with all of this press he's getting, do you think this will be the thing that will make him take accountability? Oh, uh, maybe, maybe. I think, I mean, there's been many things uh, that I feel like could be cancel worthy. Uh, For instance, going to Thailand, taking photos with tigers and posting it, bragging about it and not only getting hate for it, but then showing up to Nick Vial's podcast with a framed photo 45 minutes late. So that's one thing. No remorse there. And then he continues on to do the New York Times article, which was actually recorded before the Nick Vial podcast. I think now that this has gotten so big, will he ever take accountability? I don't know. I think with the whole SNL thing that Sandoval is actually going to like it because he likes being in the spotlight. And though it was about frozen embryos that really had nothing to do with him and Ariana's frozen embryos, had to do with an actual news article and then kind of making fun of him, I think he'll take it as a ha-ha joke and love it that he was even mentioned because he's a narcissist. Though he might not like that the embryo called him a narcissist like I have. I do think him posing with a tiger and all of that is fucked up, especially him bringing the photo, knowing that this was a controversial issue to Nick Vile's podcast and being like, haha, here you go, Nick. Like, no, 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 no. I also, with cancel culture, you have to realize this. And this might not be something you guys know. 
but it's something that I say a lot. No one can cancel you but yourself. And Tom is slowly canceling himself. People already don't like him. Yeah, that's good enough. But the only person that can cancel Tom Sandoval is Tom Sandoval. So it really will be up to, is Tom going to cancel himself? Is he going to just end this, like, you know, TV career, all of that now? Or is he going to keep playing up into it and being a villain and a bad guy and not taking accountability and not getting the help he needs and yada, yada, yada? It's up to him. Well, it's interesting, too, because, you know, when the whole thing first broke, your names were kind of lumped together in the same sentences. But now it seems like you've gone one way and he's gone another way. Do you see that? And how does that feel? Yes. Well, we handled the situation very differently. And I think it's very interesting to see how the public has kind of reacted to the way that we've handled the situation. First of all, it was like, I'm running away from my problems. And Tom is actually going back and facing it and holding up to his filming obligation. But after the New York Times article, people are starting to see how toxic and dark reality TV is and how detrimental it can be to your mental health if you're not able to take time away to process through your life. I think it's important to have these conversations that we're having now, like what are the long-term effects that reality TV can have on a person? How is it affecting their mental health? I think these are all questions to keep in the forefront of our mind as we continue watching Vanderpump Rules and other reality TV shows. I can't agree with her that I do believe that with everything that has been said and done with everybody involved in Scandival, that we all need to take this time to realize that reality TV does have an impact on people. I think that it is a great thing that is being recognized a little bit more. I think that this Scandival kind of helped it in that sense. I think people were aware of it. Not a lot of people talked about it and more people are because of it. And that is a good thing. I do in the sense think she did run away from her problems because even if it was a real life situation, her running away to get treatment and then icing everybody out and not talking to them ever again is not how you handle real life situations as an adult. I do think she has done the needed steps that she needs mentally to be where she needs to be to be able to understand things. And I do think that maybe in the future there might be conversations with people if she's willing to be the adult and have those conversations and actually listen to what people have to say to her. I will also say, this is the end of the podcast. It was short and sweet. That's why I did a two-for-one with this podcast, and I put the New York Post along with her podcast because she talks about it. So it was easy to do a two-in-one for you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Let me know your thoughts and opinions down below, especially your thoughts and opinion on Rachel and this whole podcast situation with me, and then what this podcast was this week that she decided to just talk about all the articles that were out and continue, in my opinion, talking about the drama that does not involve her because she thinks it involves her because she was part of the whole affair. Now, she could be going on her own way with this podcast and, like I said, recognizing where she is mentally, how the impact she's had because of it, and where she is in this process of preparing and fixing her mental health. I think she could do a better job with it. I think she could be more informative and have more people on that not just answer her questions, but answer everyone's questions. Questions that a lot of us have about mental health. I don't necessarily think that they always need to focus on her and the Scandal situation and what she went through and keep repeating it and repeating it with different therapists. I think that's just kind of redundant. And I think that she needs to show us that she's progressing forward and not getting involved with everything that's happening with Vanderpump. 
But let me know what you guys think down below. Make sure to like this video and then subscribe to my Rumble, my YouTube, my Odyssey, wherever you are watching this from. Please make sure you're subscribed. And if this is on Rumble, I will notify you on YouTube in the community tab every time I post a new video for right now until everything is fixed. And of course, once it's fixed, I will let you all know. And I want to say thank you all for supporting me on this journey and liking my content and everything that I do here on my channel. And I hope that this situation can be fixed soon so we can continue to enjoy ourselves on my channel. I hope you all have a wonderful day and I will talk to you guys again soon. Bye everyone. I'm gonna burn all the bridges between us.